We are beginning here today a study of Roman Catholic tradition from both a biblical as well as an historical perspective. I've entitled this series, Roman Catholic Tradition, Its Roots, Development, and Change. Another subtitle that I could use, and which I almost did use, is this one. Was the Protestant Reformation legitimate? The Roman Catholic Church claims that it is the one true church established by Christ, that it can trace its succession and its teachings from, for 2,000 years back to the apostles and ultimately to Christ himself. It claims that the Protestant Church is a schismatic movement, that it has embraced heretical teachings, teachings which it says are not only contrary to Scripture but also to history. It teaches that the Protestant Church has rejected the authority of Christ by separating from the Church of Rome. Many view the Reformation as a huge tragedy that has had dire consequences for the Church of Jesus Christ in the world. Christ did, after all, pray that his church would live in unity in John chapter 17. And the Protestant Church, so the claim goes, is responsible for promoting disunity in its rejection, ultimately, of the authority of the Bishop of Rome. There are many today in both the Roman Catholic and Protestant camps who feel that the issues that separate Protestants and Roman Catholics at the time of the Reformation should be laid aside and we should come back together in unity under, of course, the authority of the Bishop of Rome. The ecumenical movement is very strong in the day in which we live, and there are many who want to minimize and ultimately compromise the truth that men and women gave their lives for in the Reformation. I do not personally believe that the Reformation was illegitimate, unnecessary, or a tragedy. The tragedy lies in the fact that it was necessary. Many today talk about unity, but it is a unity that minimizes and compromises truth. The Lord Jesus Christ never taught that we are to seek unity at the expense of truth. In the book of Galatians, Paul makes the truth of the gospel the standard of unity. And as far as he is concerned, where that standard is compromised, there can be no unity. For to compromise the gospel is to forsake Christ himself. I believe that the Reformation was a movement of the Spirit of God and one of the greatest revivals the church has ever witnessed because it restored to the church the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which I believe had become corrupted through the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church, much as God's truth had become corrupted in the Old Testament dispensation through the traditions of Judaism. The Protestant Reformation did not embrace heresy. It rejected heresy and restored truth to the church as summarized in the clarion calls of sola scriptura, sola fide, sola Christus, and sola gratia. I make no apologies for making such statements, and I plan in the sessions that we have together to back up what I say with facts, both biblical and historical. I am not here to blast Roman Catholics. Often Roman Catholic apologists refer to those who criticize the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church as being anti-Catholic. I really do take issue with that kind of language. Am I to describe Roman Catholic apologists as anti-Protestants? I may not agree with Roman Catholic doctrine, but I am not against Roman Catholics as people. I will attempt, with all that is in me and the time that we have together, to deal fairly and objectively with the Roman Catholic Church and its teachings. All too often, Protestants have not dealt accurately with the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and sometimes have misrepresented what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. But I believe I have done my homework and that I can fairly and accurately share what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. As a former Roman Catholic who is now a Protestant, I have had to ask myself the question, can the Protestant position be validated both biblically as well as historically? I stand before you today to say that I am a Protestant by choice because of truth, biblical truth and historical truth. I am not a Protestant because I have embraced a system out of ignorance, but because I know that both biblically and historically the Protestant teaching is true. In other words, for me to embrace Roman Catholicism, I would have to embrace teachings which I know in my conscience contradict the truth of Scripture and the true facts of history. In 1869 just prior to the decrees of Vatican I and papal infallibility, the German church historian, Dr. Joseph Ignaz von Dollinger, wrote a book entitled The Pope and the Council. He was the preeminent church historian in the Roman Catholic Church of his day. He had taught church history as a Roman Catholic for 47 years. His book is a protest to the impending decrees of the Vatican Council. It's an impassioned plea for that council 
in the light of the truth and the facts of history to reconsider what it was preparing to do. His plea fell on deaf ears, and he was later excommunicated, not because he was anti-Catholic, but because he refused to embrace a teaching which he knew contradicted the truth of history. His conscience was held bound to truth, and ours must be held bound by truth, both biblical and historical. Let me say one other thing. Some of the criticism of Roman Catholic apologists against modern evangelicalism and fundamentalism is valid. I believe that the Roman Catholic Church has corrupted the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I also believe that a large part of evangelicalism has done the same thing in a different way and has departed from the true teachings of the Reformation. The Roman Catholic Church rightly criticizes a gospel message that tells men they can accept Jesus as Savior and that they are guaranteed heaven while a life of obedience and holiness is optional. That simply is heresy. But it is also a perversion of the teachings of the Reformation. It is not what the Reformers taught when they preached justification by faith. And while I have written a book on Roman Catholicism, I have also written one directed towards the evangelical church. I only wish these same Roman Catholics were as willing to face as honestly the false teachings of their own church. I have listened to hours and hours of tapes by popular Roman Catholic apologists such as Scott Hahn and Jerry Matatix. Scott Hahn is a former Orthodox Presbyterian minister. Jerry Matatix is a former PCA minister who is a full-time Roman Catholic apologist. I've also done a lot of reading. And one book that is very popular today is a book by the Roman Catholic Carl Keating entitled Catholicism and Fundamentalism. He heads up along with Pat Madrid and a number of other men, a Roman Catholic apologetics organization called Catholic Answers. These men have no qualms about very aggressively, passionately, bluntly, and forcefully denouncing Protestant teachings and affirming Roman Catholic tradition. They are absolutely convinced they are right, and I respect that, although they are guilty of consistently misrepresenting Protestantism and of distorting the facts of history. But I reserve the same right to aggressively, passionately, bluntly, and forcefully to defend the biblical gospel and Protestant faith from what I believe are false assertions historically and a misrepresentation and undermining of the authority of the word of God by, by traditions which are the traditions of men. We have every right to subject the Roman Catholic claims to the standard of scripture and of history. For the church claims to base its teachings on both and to be able to validate it by both. The issues that separate Roman Catholics and Protestants are not minor issues. They are of major importance as they have to do with the eternal destinies of men and women. We need to come back to an understanding of what the issues were all about in the controversies of the Reformation, for those issues have not changed. We can have a very academic kind of uh, mentality, if you will, towards these issues. These issues were not ac academic for the men and women who went through the Reformation. Many of them gave their lives, being burned at the stake for the very truths of which we will be discussing. It can be academic for us. It certainly was not academic for them. Basically, the issues between the Protestant and Roman Catholic churches can be categorized under two broad headings. First of all, there's the issue of authority, under which we can include the topics of Scripture, tradition, the church, and the papacy. Secondly, you have the issue of the gospel or salvation, under which we can include the topics of Mary, the sacramental system, purgatory, and justification. We have fundamentally different views of ultimate authority, the nature of the church and the gospel and salvation. And it is these specific topics that I will be addressing in our time together. Now, I would just like to give a quick overview in this session that we have right now, a quick overview of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, which will be a preview to the time that we will spend together in the sessions that we have together. The Roman Catholic Church claims to be the one true church established by Jesus Christ. It claims that its tradition is a source of revelation and equally as inspired as the scriptures. The one is called the written word of God, while the other is referred to as the unwritten word of God. It's important to emphasize that the church does believe in the full inspiration of scripture, just as the Protestant church does. But it adds oral tradition as a separate and independent source of revelation to the scriptures. So while it is authoritative 
That is, the scriptures are authoritative. The scriptures are not the sole or the ultimate authority. The Roman church teaches that the Roman Catholic church alone has been given authority to correctly interpret scripture and that it is infallible in so doing. Can claim a 2,000 year consensus and can be validated by what the Council of Trent and Vatican I call the unanimous consent of the fathers. It claims that the Protestant teaching of Sola Scriptura is both unbiblical and unhistorical. It teaches further that the Old Testament apocryphal books are part of the canon and that the Pope is visible head of the church, universal, and vicar of Christ on earth. He is also infallible when teaching ex cathedra on faith and morals. And the church states in no uncertain terms that it is necessary for salvation that a person accept these teachings on the papacy and submit to the bishop of Rome. Refusal to do so results in that individual being anathematized by the Roman Catholic Church. That is, they are put under an eternal curse and condemnation. In the Bull Unum Sanctum, for example, which was promulgated by Boniface VIII in 1302, I believe, or 1303, he makes this statement. We declare, say, define, and pronounce to be altogether necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. Now, that is a true ex cathedra statement by a bishop of Rome. And the Council of Florence declared, no one, even if he has shed blood for the name of Christ, can be saved unless he has remained in the bosom and unity of the Catholic Church. So clearly, you cannot know salvation according to these dogmatic decrees of the Roman Catholic Church unless you are part of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Church of Rome also states that its teachings on papal rule and infallibility are teachings which have always been recognized in the Church from the very beginning and that the interpretation of the scriptures used to support these teachings can be validated by the unanimous consent of the fathers in their interpretations of those same passages. The Roman Catholic Church further teaches that Mary was immaculately conceived, that is, she was born free of original sin. It also teaches that she was assumed into heaven and is presently a mediatrix with Jesus Christ, that she is the mother of the church, crowned as queen of heaven, and that no grace can come to any person on earth save through Mary. And any who would knowingly reject the teachings of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption are likewise anathematized by the popes. Now, relative to the sacramental system, the Church of Rome teaches that baptism by water regenerates a person, that Christ instituted a human priesthood which mediates grace through auricular confession, absolution and penance, and through the offering of the Mass. In the Mass, the elements of the Eucharist, according to Roman Catholic teaching, are literally changed into the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ and that he is subsequently immolated on the altar as a propitiatory sacrifice to make atonement for sin. In other words, the Mass itself is a propitiatory sacrifice for sin. In addition, through penance and purgatory, men can atone for their own sins And through good works and the enduring of suffering, they can gain merit, which earns forgiveness in eternal life. And the church has anathematized anyone who would knowingly reject these teachings. For example, the Council of Trent says, if anyone says that the sacrifice of the Mass is only a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, or that it is only a commemoration of the sacrifice consummated on the cross, but not a propitiatory sacrifice, let him be anathema. The Roman Catholic Church has stated officially that all of its sacramental or all of its sacraments are necessary for salvation. In other words, a person cannot be saved outside of the Roman Catholic Church and its sacramental system. Now, relative to justification, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that it is a process that is directly related to good works and sanctification and personal merit. It is not a work once for all accomplished by Jesus Christ. It is directly grounded in human works, though they are works, according to Roman Catholic teaching, which are empowered by grace. It is a state that can be lost and regained depending on the presence of sanctifying grace in the soul. Now, sometimes it can be very confusing in dealing with these issues because the Protestant and Roman Catholic churches use the same terms. But the thing we need to understand is that we don't mean the same things by the same terms that we use. 
we give different content to these same theological terms. When a Roman Catholic says, for example, he believes we are saved by grace through faith in Christ, he does not mean what a Protestant means, though it sounds very biblical. For a Roman Catholic, salvation is mediated through the church, its priesthood and sacraments. This is why the church calls itself the universal sacrament of salvation. And in the weeks to come, I'm going to take issue with the claims of the Roman Catholic Church on both biblical as well as historical grounds. Its claims cannot be validated in the vast majority of cases either biblically or historically, by the writings of the church fathers or by the facts of church history. The Roman Catholic Church has, in fact, departed from the faith and the teachings of the Catholic Church of the first centuries and has become Roman and not Catholic. For in its tradition, it has added teachings, which it says are necessary for salvation, but were either never taught by the early church or are contrary to Scripture and thereby invalidated. The call of the Reformation was a call for the church to return to the authority of Scripture and the faith of the early church from which it had departed. The Roman Catholic Church says so the Scripture is both unbiblical and unhistorical. We're going to see, however, on the contrary, that it is both biblical as well as historical. That is, it is patristic in that it is a teaching that was universally held by the church of the early centuries. I will demonstrate that the Roman Catholic claim of oral tradition as a separate source of revelation independent of Scripture was rejected in the early church as a Gnostic heresy and was not the teaching of the church until the latter part of the Middle Ages when it was finally adopted by the Council of Trent. The Roman Catholic Church claims a 2,000-year consensus for its teachings and the unanimous consent of the fathers. I will show, on the contrary, that such a consensus does not exist for its teachings. In fact, both the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption teachings of Mary were condemned in the Church of the Patristic Age. The Immaculate Conception was first proposed by Pelagius in the 5th century, a heretic, and it was repudiated by Augustine and all the Church of that time. It was later likewise repudiated by Bernard of Clairvaux in the 11th century and by Thomas Aquinas in the 13th. The teaching of the Assumption was condemned as a heresy by Pope Galatius in 495, and by Pope Hormisdus in 520. The Roman Catholic Church claims that it alone has been granted by Christ authority and infallibility in interpreting Scripture. But I'm going to show that the most important passage of Scripture for the Roman Catholic Church, the one which is foundational for establishing its authority and the authority of the papacy, that passage being Matthew 16, 18, the passage about the rock and Peter, that the interpretation of this passage given by the Roman Catholic Church was almost universally rejected in the early church. There was a consensus, if you will, a unanimous consensus relative to the interpretation of that passage in the early church, but it was a unanimous opposition to that interpretation, and this was so for centuries and is still so in the Eastern Church. Relative to the teachings of papal infallibility, we're going to see that this teaching is totally undermined by the facts of history, for it is a fact, just to give one example that the Sixth Ecumenical Council officially condemned Pope Honorius in his official capacity as Pope as a heretic. And historically it can be proven that the church for at least the first 1,300 years never viewed the Pope to be infallible. It will be shown that the teaching of purgatory is pagan in origin and was not, as claimed by the Roman Catholic Church, the faith of the early church. And it is, in fact, a perversion of the teaching of the all-sufficient atonement of Jesus Christ. We will see that the sacramental teachings of the Roman Catholic Church are a perversion of the biblical teaching on salvation and cannot claim a unanimous consent of the fathers. They come under the censor of Paul in his letter to the Galatians of another gospel that perverts the grace of God. For in principle, the sacramental teachings of Roman Catholicism reflect the error of the Judaizers, which Paul condemns in the book of Galatians. For in its teachings on salvation and justification, the Roman Catholic Church adds works to the gospel a teaching which we are constantly warned against in the Word of God. You know, the great need of man in every age is a need for authority and for salvation. And the biblical gospel addresses both of those needs. My overwhelming sincere concern is that men and women, be they Roman Catholic or Protestant, understand the truth of the gospel. There is nothing else ultimately that really matters. And that in understanding it, we might be equipped to heed Paul's words to Timothy, to guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to us. The Reformation was born out of the context of the teachings of Roman Catholicism. When the Reformers called for Sola Scriptura, they were not abandoning the principle of authority 
but affirming the true authority established by God, that being submission to his word and to himself. There is authority in the church. The reformers affirm this, but it is a derived authority which is under the word of God and which can go no further than the scriptures. And we will see that affirmed when we come to our session on history and tradition and scripture, that this was the truth that was affirmed by the fathers of the early church. When the reformers call for sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christus, they were not teaching an abandonment of a life of obedience or an abandonment of sacraments, but restoring these truths to their proper context. They were affirming the biblical teaching that salvation is not a work of man, not even in a cooperative sense, but a work of a sovereign God from beginning to end. They emphasized truths often at the cost of their lives that had become obscured through the centuries through the traditions, the teachings of men. Ultimately, they held to the conviction expressed by Peter and John in the book of Acts when they were forbidden to preach Jesus. They said, we must obey God, not man. We must be a people who are committed to truth. It was this above everything else that the reformers were concerned about and which they were willing to die for. I recently heard Carl Keating tell a mixed audience of Protestants and Roman Catholics that we are all, or that we all have a responsibility to seek for truth and to submit to it no matter where it leads or how contradictory it may be to what we always have held. I couldn't agree more. But we need to understand something about presuppositions. Presuppositions can blind us to truth no matter how much evidence a man can be presented with. Carl Keating's word needs to be heeded by Carl Keating and by Roman Catholics. The Jews rejected Jesus Christ based partly on presuppositions. We've been circumcised. We're God's chosen people. We have hundreds of years of tradition. We cannot err, even though they have been confronted time after time after time with the evidence of the truth of who Jesus is by the miracles that he did. They turned a blind eye to them because they allowed their presuppositions to blind them to the truth of who he was and to what he was teaching. Likewise, a Roman Catholic can hold presuppositions which blind him to truth. The church is infallible and cannot err. Whatever, therefore, the church teaches must be true and of divine origin. And when I'm faced with facts which contradict what that teaching says, then there has to be some other explanation for it, and we just turn a blind eye to the facts. We don't allow them to speak. This leads to an uncritical spirit which blindly accepts whatever the church and the Pope teaches. People blindly accept it based on their presuppositions. They refuse to allow facts to speak to them. So you have the situation of a Pope declaring that it is divinely revealed truth that Mary was assumed into heaven when it was earlier condemned. Or you have a Pope standing on a public platform in 1986 before the world, arm in arm with the Dalai Lama, Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, Baha'is, Shintoists, and pagan cult leaders who are the enemies of Jesus Christ to pray for peace. That action was a betrayal of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine a bishop of the early church standing with representatives of Gnosticism, of Roman and Greek pagan deities, and other cults to pray for peace? That would be unthinkable. But because of the presupposition of infallibility, Men and women blindly accept such behavior and it leads them into error because they do not do what the Bereans did with the preaching of Paul. The Bereans submitted his teaching to the test of Scripture, to the standard of truth. You can't just assume infallibility and allow that to be the grid through which everything else passes. Infallibility has to be proven. A searcher of truth must be willing to lay aside presuppositions and allow truth to prevail and speak to the heart. That is what we want to do in our time together, to submit Roman Catholic teaching to the standard of truth, historical and biblical. And in so doing, I believe we will see that the Protestant Reformation was both justified and legitimate.